Hello, everybody. I'm Howie Hawkins. I was the Green Party candidate for president in 2020. And this podcast, Green Socialist Notes, is about educating and organizing around the eco-socialist program that Angela Walker and I ran on. So I'm going to say a few words about what's going on. And then uh, we'll take your questions and comments. And let me uh, give you an early warning right now. Next week, we have a special guest, Matthew Ho, who is uh, the Green Party candidate for senator from North Carolina. And if you followed uh, any war movement, any militarism, uh, you should know who he is. He was a did two tours of duty as a Marine and then uh, as a State Department Foreign Service officer in Afghanistan and then quit in 2009 in opposition to the war. And he's been a strong voice against U.S. militarism and imperialism. So uh, I can't wait to talk to him next week, especially given where we are right now with the Ukraine crisis. You know, Biden and Putin talked this morning. We got a readout from Biden's side, and he gave tough talk. You know, if Putin goes in, there are going to be sanctions and uh, consequences for Russia's status on the world stage. Haven't heard a readout from Putin's side, but, uh, you know, it's concerning that all countries, with people in Ukraine, including Russia and the U.S., are telling their people to get out of Ukraine this weekend. Um, it's it's hard to believe. I don't see what Putin gains from a big war in Ukraine. Uh, it's going to cost him a lot, cost Russia a lot, obviously going to cost the Ukrainians a lot. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of talk from Releases from our intelligence side, whether that's information warfare or the real deal, it's hard to know. But uh, as I think about this, it's kind of mystifying when you realize that uh, Biden has appointed U.S. ambassadors to about two dozen countries, including the Ukraine, Russia, and Britain, which in this crisis are central players. Um, remember, Trump fired the last ambassador for opposing Rudy Giuliani's uh, fishing expedition to find dirt on Hunter Biden. And uh, Trump fired that woman. Uh, Now, Biden has sent a name to the Senate, uh, no, to Ukraine for vetting. And they've been slow getting back. So it's kind of mystifying what's going on. You know, maybe Ukraine wants to deal directly with State Department people and not go through an ambassador. But uh, and then when it comes to uh, they, they've appointed somebody for Britain, but hasn't been confirmed yet. And then Biden asked Trump's appointee, John Sullivan, to stay as the ambassador to Russia. So, you know, as I've said many times, U.S. imperialism didn't skip a beat between Trump and Biden. There's some differences, but uh, the U.S. is not back down. Uh, Bernie Sanders made a call for diplomacy, but I think it was marred by basically talking about uh, dividing the world into spheres of influence, even invoked the Monroe Doctrine, which is uh, a cover for U.S. imperialism in Latin America. And it goes above the heads of the Ukrainians. And, you know, as socialists, we shouldn't support great power imperialism, whether it's Russian or American or anybody else. And we should demand that both powers respect Ukraine's sovereignty and independence. And the U.S. is played a big role in Ukraine, going back to the coup in 2014, which some people say was all fascist. I think there was legitimate grievances, particularly over corruption and democracy that brought lots of people out, but the right was better organized and did play a big role. Although their electoral support has diminished down to basically nothing. So Aboda used to have representation in there. Parliament has none now. On the other hand, There are right-wing militias that are even getting armed by U.S. and trained by U.S. advisors uh, and have been incorporated into the Ukrainian military. So Ukraine's politics are messed up. It's very corrupt. Uh, The parties are vacuous. They're basically aligned with oligarchs. The guy who's president now basically did it because he used to be in a TV show where the as a school teacher who became the president. And he kind of ran in any corruption campaign. But he has no base among the oligarchs. So, you know, if war breaks out, you wonder if, you know, the right's going to try to take it from him. Putin's going to try to take it from him. It's hard to know what will happen, but he doesn't have a strong base. 
So we got a situation where U.S. imperialism continues. Biden has failed to revive the Iran nuclear deal. The war in Yemen goes on through Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, you know, to a humanitarian, creating a humanitarian disaster there. We've had these sanctions and people in Afghanistan are starving. Um, and the sanctions against Cuba and sanctions and regime shame efforts against Venezuela continue. Um, you know, the U.S. is all over the globe with 800 foreign military bases. But Putin's pretty much everywhere, too. Russia, you know, they occupy 20 percent of Georgia. They occupy Transnistria province of Moldova on Ukraine's western border. They occupy Crimea. They're messing around in the Donbass. They have a lot of troops in Belarus. And then the Wagner mercenaries, the Wagner group, which is kind of like Russia's version of Eric Prince's Blackwater, has had their mercenaries in Libya, Syria, Mali, Burkina Faso, Mozambique. A, a lot of uh, left critics in this country pointed out that the guy who led the military coup in Burkina Faso was trained by the U.S. military. It's also true that one of his beefs against the elected president was that he wouldn't bring in the Wagner group to fight Islamist rebels in the northern part of that country. So um, you actually have, even though there's a big conflict over Ukraine, you have this sort of antagonistic cooperation between these two big powers, Russia and the United States. When Wagner went into Mozambique, they were protecting Total, the French uh, oil company, ExxonMobil. ENI, which is an Italian oil company, the China National Petroleum Corporation, and SASO, which is the state-owned oil corporation of South Africa. So they went in there protecting Western interests, including ExxonMobil, although they, the Islamists threw them out. They were taking too many casualties, and they left. Uh, we've seen it in Syria against ISIS. The U.S. and Russia have these deconfliction channels, and we saw that in operation recently when the U.S. went in and took out that ISIS leader in Idlib province, where Russia controls the airspaces. Um, we see it, Russia is quietly tolerating Israeli strikes on Iranian targets in Syria, you know, Hezbollah, uh, militias from Iran, or Iranian-oriented militias from Iraq. And, uh, you know, reporting from Middle Eastern outlets say, you know, Russia and Israel have an unspoken agreement on that. And then you had, you know, Russia going into Kazakhstan to suppress that revolt by workers. And uh, the U.S. is the second biggest investor in Kazakhstan after China, including Chevron and ExxonMobil oil and gas fields. So the Russian mercenaries, or, or actually in this case military, uh, was protecting U.S. assets. So you have this strange dance going on. And a lot of people uh, have made a lot of the communique between uh, that was issued by Putin and, and Xi of China. Uh, one sentence that really stuck out at me is that the sides, the two sides, China and Russia, oppose setting up new barriers to international trade under the pretext of fighting climate change. And what they're talking about there is uh, carbon taxes as carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Um, which, you know, we need action on climate change, and that is probably one of them. Because those border climate uh, carbon adjustment mechanisms would create incentives for countries that import or export to countries like if the United States had it to lower the carbon content of their exports. But uh, Russia and China say they're opposed to that. And, you know, the irony in all this is it seems a Ukrainian solution is pretty clear. As I mentioned last week, they've got the Normandy format that Russia, uh, Ukraine, France, and Germany are engaged in. They've met recently to implement the Minsk II Accords or an updated version of them. And instead of somewhat saber rattling, the U.S. could be supporting those negotiations. And what the basic political solution there is, the U.S. and NATO agree not to admit Ukraine and Georgia into its military alliance which they have no intent in doing. I mean, Ukraine can't meet the standards just in terms of all the corruption they have. Um, and there's no need, uh, you know, from a military point of view. Uh, the second part would be Russia guarantees Ukraine's independence uh, to develop without political interference or military interference. 
and then Ukraine would guarantee the rights for its Russian-speaking regions. And the way it would be implemented, there would be a ceasefire in Donbass, demilitarization, perhaps enforced by UN peacekeeping forces, as some of the left groups in uh, the Ukraine have uh, proposed. Not that they're a big force, but that's what they have said. Um, the U.S. would withdraw its advisors and stop sending more weapons. Russia would withdraw its military from the Donbass. And then there'd be international aid uh, for reconstruction of the Donbass region. Now, that seems like uh, a common sense solution. And it's hard to figure out, you know, exactly what Biden and, and Trump, uh, Bi Biden and Putin's game is because they got the world sitting on the edge of our seats wondering what the hell is going to happen. And then I'll just make two more comments and we'll, we'll get to questions. Um, one thing I've really noticed this week is that the Democrats are moving hard to the right. Uh, you're getting a lot of law and order messaging in Senate and congressional races from Democrats. Uh, you had this week uh, very Democratic states like New York and New Jersey and California uh, remove the masking mandates. Death rates are still high from Omicron. And it seems they're putting business interests over public health. I mean, what's the rush? The Omicron is retreating rapidly. And if we don't get another variant coming in, maybe then the time is to, you know, lift the mandates that you have to wear masks in, you know, indoor settings and so forth. But, you know, what's the rush? Our, the death rates right now are nearly as high as they've ever been. And the other thing I've noticed is uh, the Democrats and the Republicans with them are still pushing school privatization, which means charter schools. The Oakland School Board, against strong community opposition, voted this week to shut down seven public schools over the next two years. And I see that Arne Duncan, who was a big architect of uh, school privatization in the Obama administration, is getting ready to run for Chicago mayor. You know, and after Rahm Emanuel shut down 50 public schools in one day, uh, I guess you couldn't do worse. But if anybody could, it's Arne Duncan. So uh, those are issues. There are a lot of issues, but those are issues I've noticed this week. And then the last thing I want to point out is, you know, we got no climate program from Congress. And time is a wasting. The International Panic Panel on Climate Change report on uh, what it would take to get uh, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, said the world needs to cut emissions by 50% by 2030. And that would be 10% per year starting last year. Uh, if we wait until, say, the next administration, 2025, uh, that's a 20% cut per year starting in 2025 to get there by 2030. So we don't have any time to waste. Meanwhile, Global emissions rose 5% last year. U.S. emissions rose 6%. So that's an extremely serious situation. It's, uh, you know, it's why we need the Green Party to be out there running candidates, raising these issues, and not accepting that uh, they can't get simple climate uh, actions. You know, what was proposed in Congress wasn't enough, but they can't even get that passed. So with that... Uh, I look forward to your questions and comments. Eric Gray. Also, how do we actually go about getting rid of private and charter schooling? Well, I think we start by saying public money is for public schools. You have a private school, you know, charge tuition and pay for it yourself. There's no reason why the public should be paying for private schools when it's not funding its own public schools enough. And then I think we've got to... Uh, regulate the private schools. I mean, we have a situation here. We have these, uh, these are not charters. These are yeshivas that the ultra Orthodox run in, uh, particularly in Brooklyn, New York. And the state requires that everybody get a basic education in English and math and science and history. And those kids are not getting it. I mean, they, they do religious studies and then when they're in elementary school, they get a, like 90 minutes at the end of the day for English and math. By the time they get to high school, they're not getting anything. And that's a violation of the law. But because they're politically potent, you know, in, in those, uh, you know, city council and state legislative and state senate districts 
where they're a strong majority or plurality, uh, people are afraid to take them on, and that reverberates throughout the city. So we've got to enforce the laws. There have been so many scandals with these private schools. And, uh, you know, we find those out because they become obvious. There's probably more going on because the investigations are not going on. The regulations, I mean, we've had the situation here in New York that you get a probationary period of a few years. And if you pass that, then you're not uh, examined for a while. And what we've seen is these schools get through the probationary period and then the standards go way down. So there's a lot to do. We, we can't accept the privatization of public education because then it's going to, you know, not educate children. Scout Trooper 164, what are your thoughts on a corrupt Republican backing Bernie Sanders' plan to lower the prices of prescription drugs? Uh, I'm not sure which corrupt Republican it was. Sanders' plan has been to have Medicare negotiate lower prices. Um, so I don't know. I think actually Manchin's for that. Is that the corrupt Republican you're referring to? Um, look, uh, this is a big issue. I mean, it's something like 85% of Americans want Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices. So uh, I don't know if the Republican's corrupt, but he's politically smart to get on that side of the issue. So, you know, let's, let's take the help where we can get it and get that passed. But, you know, the problem is the filibuster. You know, you do have a lot of hardcore um, uh, politicians on the Democratic side, too, but as well as Republicans who are drenched in the money of the drug companies. And so, you know, we saw that with uh, uh, cinema out there in Arizona, a Democrat who basically took in the money from the drug companies and wasn't with this uh, plan to nego have Medicare negotiate lower drug prices. So, I mean, that, that's why it's so damn frustrating. You know, the people want something overwhelmingly, and it doesn't translate into public policy because a bunch of big corporations bribe the politicians. Uh, you know, we had, you know, this uh, voting rights legislation, that public campaign finance reform. Well, Greens have been very critical of that because it disadvantaged third parties. Um, but even then, it was basically public money matching funds added on to basically unlimited private money. So to, so it makes the private financing, the legalized bribery, look better because there's a little public money in there. Uh, that's a whole other area that just doesn't get the coverage and discussion that it deserves. I mean, the disadvantages of third parties were just not covered in the mainstream media. When they totally eliminated the... Uh, presidential public campaign funding in the second iteration of Freedom to Vote Act, you know, I, I was calling reporters at, you know, major media or, or emailing them, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today saying, you know, this is a big post-Watergate reform, one of the signature reforms of the uh, Federal uh, Election Campaign Act. And they didn't care. It's probably because only the Greens are still using that public funding program as it's now, now situated, as it now exists. Um, the irony is the last version they voted on, which was the Freedom to Vote, colon, John R. Lewis Act, just left the presidential thing alone. They, they cut out the section that would have that was in the Freedom to, original Freedom to Vote Act to transfer the money from the presidential campaign funding to the new House uh, campaign funding program. And I think, I don't know why they did that. I think they might have been moving too fast. The bill was dropped at 6 o'clock one day and voted on 10 a.m. the next morning before anybody could read something like 900 pages, 700 pages. Um, I think it was an oversight, but I don't know. It's just speculation. In any case, uh, it's not just corrupt Republicans blocking this uh, Medicare negotiating prescription drugs. And... Uh, it's, that's just one of the biggest shames in this country. We're paying five to time, 10 times more than countries right next to us, like Canada, for the same drugs. All right, Judas Stir Stir. 
What are your thoughts on the Canadian trucker situation? It seems like a proto-fascist effort that socialists should decry, but the American left has been all over the board. Yeah, that's because the American left aren't workers. These are not workers. They're not truckers. I'm a retired Teamster. Teamsters hate these people. These people are either owner operators who can, you know, are doing well and can afford to go there, or they've been sent there by trucking companies that are right wingers. And the demands being raised, you know, the real issues for Canadian truckers are wage theft. One third of those truckers in, in uh, Canada are South Asian, and they get cheated out of their wages a lot. They get discriminated against. They have ridiculous working hours. Uh, those are the real labor issues. And these same so-called truckers that uh, are doing these demonstrations are the same ones that uh, are the scabs against the labor actions that uh, Canadian real truckers are taking to try to get better situation, you know, concerning their working hours. And 90% uh, of Canadian truckers are vaccinated. That's not an issue. Uh, there are more of them vaccinated than the average. I think the Canadian average uh, vaccination rate is 78%. So, and then you look at what's in the crowd. There are Confederate flags. There are swastikas. There are all kinds of conspiracy theories, you know, from the vaccines have microchips to lizard people and, uh, you know, uh, what do they call them? The, 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 what's the QAnon theory? The children are being kidnapped and the QAnon people are around. Uh, and, and the leaders of this movement are not working people. They are not in the trucking industry. They're the same people that have led uh, right-wing movements in the past, including, you know, separatist movements out in uh, the Western provinces and anti-immigrant, racist, white nationalist kind of politics. And you see a lot of Trump flags on the Canadian side of the border. That's what they're trying to, trying to build that kind of movement. Um, and, you know, when, when socialists say this is a workers' movement, they don't know what a workers' movement is. They don't know these workers. They listen to the workers. The Teamsters in Canada, the Teamsters in the U.S. have denounced this. The uh, uh, Canadian Federation of Labor denounced this. Uh, you see these, uh, you know, phony Indian ceremonies and drum circles. The indigenous people are outraged by that, considering it, you know, racist, disrespectful appropriation of their culture. Um, this is a right-wing movement, and the vaccine mandate is just the excuse. They have a whole other agenda, and it's basically white nationalism. So, yeah, the the the, uh, the socialists that fell for that, uh, you know, they, they need to get connected to real working people. Michael Shin, what are your thoughts on the prison abolition movement? Uh, I think the word abolition as a slogan uh, doesn't resonate, you know, with the general public. What we need to be talking about is uh, ending mass incarceration, uh, alternatives to incarceration, um, bail reform. In other words, we need to reform the system. When you say abolition, I mean, people think you're just going to turn all the prisoners loose. There's some people in there that are dangerous that need to be segregated. So, um, you know, I'm with the people that call themselves abolitionists in spirit. I think it's the wrong slogan. And uh, this is another area where we're going backwards. You know, after the George Floyd demonstrations, there was a lot of talk about sometimes the slogan was defunding the police. I had a problem with that slogan, too, because people think, you know, take the police away from them. Uh, you know, what we need is to put those resources into crime prevention. The Center for Economic and Policy Research had a nice summary of the statistics. Uh, the, the most gun violence right now is going on in uh, black communities with extreme poverty. And if you chart poverty rate in those communities versus gun uh, violence rate, perfect correlation. The more poverty, the more gun violence. So right there, you know, we need to have a serious anti-poverty program. Uh, and then we know of examples like Richmond, California, under a green mayor um, back in 2008 to 2016, I believe. Um, they adopted a program of focusing on 
the youth in gangs that were most likely to be shooters. And they gave them opportunities. In fact, for a while, they gave them $1,000 a month if they stayed out of trouble every month. Um, and then the police did uh, community policing instead of drive-by and uh, snatch and grab operations and got to know the people and the businesses on their beats, uh, build a better relationship so that uh, they got better intelligence as to when things might go down and there might be shootings. And so the murder rate in Richmond, which is about 80 uh, percent black and Latino and Asian, um, was over 40 per 100,000, which is one of the highest in the country. Been that way for decades. And it was 44 the year this new program started. After eight years, they had only only seven murders. So um, the program worked. So we have examples like that. And so it, it pains me to see, like here in New York, we had bail reform and uh, the crime rate is going up. And the you know law and order folks are saying it's because of bail reform. Bail reform meant uh, you could be released without having to pay bail for nonviolent offenses. And, you know, we had a famous case uh, here where a kid spent three years in Rikers Island. Uh, he was accused of stealing a backpack. Uh, it took three years to bring his case to trial. And when it, when it, when it came time to do that, uh, the, the uh, Bronx attorney, where it happened, district attorney said he didn't have the evidence, so he's dropping the case. This kid spent three years in Rikers Island, got his ass kicked by gangs, by the guards. Uh, he came out a damaged person and after a couple of years eventually committed suicide. That's the kind of travesty that happens when you have bail for those who can afford it, like Paul Manafort and that crowd around Trump. They didn't, they didn't wait around in jail. They made bail. But if you're poor and, you, you know, accused of grabbing a, a backpack and it turns out they didn't have evidence that he did it, uh, you know, he spent three years in jail and had his life ruined. So now we're having efforts to repeal it. Um, and, you know, that's going on around the country in, in uh, different places where, you know, another thing they did in Richmond last year was they, they didn't call it defunding the police. I forget what they called it, but it was, you know, positive investments in uh, crime prevention. And they put money into social services out of the police department, substantial amount. So, you know, that's the kind of thing we need to be doing. And uh, watch out for the law and order messaging from the Democrats. The other thing I'm seeing is they're touting military officers. I mean, we have a congressional race here. They redrew the district, it looks like, and it's much more Democratic friendly than it's been in Syracuse, which is one of the was one of the few competitive districts in the country. And uh, three of the uh, candidates out of six and the latter three jumped in late when the dis new district lines became clear, they all tout, you know, them being in the military. And that's all they tout. I mean, their campaigns are totally vacuous. You don't know what they stand for. They just say, I was in the military. Um, and I, you know, I lived in this community forever and all that kind of thing. But nothing about policy. You know, give us a reason to vote for you. So uh, I don't know, the progressives in the uh, Democratic Party they don't have the leverage. They're, they're a minority within the caucus. With the Republicans being in opposition, that gives all the leverage to the right-wing Democrats like Manchin and Cinema. And the progressives tried to play the inside game and negotiate, and they just kept making concessions because they didn't have any power. You know, I think they've been better off going to the public and mobilizing support and having the pressure come from outside because they didn't have the power inside. Um, but that's why they're Democrats and why we're Greens. We know we got to do that. Jacob Moore, how do we push third party health care reform through to the mainstream of the DNC and RNC? Demonstrate a silencing of democracy. Wait, I'm not sure I read that right. How do we push third party health care reform through to the mainstream of the Democrat National Committee and Republican National Committee? Demonstrate a silencing of democracy. Well, I, I, maybe what you mean, I think what you mean by there is that this is another thing where, you know, Fox News took an exit poll election day in 2020, 20, and they called single payer uh, government run health insurance. And 72 percent of the people said, yeah, that's what we want. Um, 
And the other part of your question, is there something more we can do on a local and congressional level to push the issue during COVID? Uh, certainly on a congressional level, local, I would say state level, we can pass state level single payer healthcare systems. California, Democrats just killed it again in California. We've had it pending in New York. The Democrats said who passed the bill in the assembly many times since the early 1990s, we can't get it passed because the Senate is majority uh, Republican. Well, since the 2018 election, the majority in the New York State Senate has been majority Democrat. And after 2020, a super majority, a veto-proof majority. But since they got the majorities, they also got lots of money from the health insurance industry, and they can't even get this bill out of committee now. We had a similar situation in Vermont, similar situation in Hawaii. But it's such a popular thing. we got to keep pushing at the state level. I don't, I don't see it happening at the federal level at this point. It's popular, but given the makeup of this Congress and then likely next Congress, you know, the Democrats aren't running on Medicare for all. They're running on law and order, running on privatization of schools. So um, I think where we can, you know, states like California, New York, Hawaii, uh, Illinois, I think is one where it's a possibility. There, there are others. And show that it works well at the state level. I think that's how we uh, then get to the point where the uh, people in Congress begin to look at it more seriously, at least give it a hearing. I mean, we've had a terrible situation. Go back to the Clinton administration. John Conyers was carrying the single-payer bill. He couldn't even get to testify when the Senate, which was writing the bill, uh, had its hearings. We had people arrested. I was arrested at that time up here uh, protesting in front of an insurance company that was uh, had been suspended for not uh, paying out uh, Medicare benefits that it had been contracted under a Medicare Advantage program to do. Um, we had people, Ken, Ken, Kevin Zeese and Margaret Flowers, who worked on our campaign, were arrested at that time around those hearings. And then we, no, that was Conyers under Clinton. This was under Obama. That's when we all got arrested, around 2009, 2000, yeah, 2009. Um, so, you know, the single payer bill has a lot of sponsors, has majority support in the public. And then when they go to write legislation on health care, they don't even let the advocates for that position, even members of Congress, testify. I mean, that's how screwed up that whole system is down there um, with, you know, they give too much power to the party leaders and the committee chairs. And so uh, it, it's a it's a farce of democracy for the rank and filers in, in both parties. They can't move stuff forward unless the leaders say so. So... Uh, you know, I think we can push it at, at the state level. We can run congressional candidates to make it a popular issue. And for, the thing you got to do is force, particularly the Democrat, but in some cases maybe you get the Republican, uh, to take a stand on Medicare for all and be prepared to argue with them and show them they're full of it when they say it's going to cost too much. No, it's going to cost less. We're going to have a more efficient use of our health care dollar. Um, it's going to give everybody coverage. Uh, the average person will pay less uh, than they do now in both taxes for the public programs like Medicare and Medicaid and for their private insurance. And those, I mean, I've, I've been arguing that. I've run some congressional races, ran against Hillary Clinton for the U.S. Senate. They got no answers. We got the answers on that one. So, you know, I urge people to get out there and fight on those issues, run candidates and and fight them. And, you know, the public's already with us, but maybe they'll come around and start voting for us. Because, uh, and then during COVID, obviously, our public health system broke down. We have disproportionately more deaths per capita than other developed countries. And it's because we have a privatized healthcare system, basically, with some public programs. And they're the ones that actually delivered most of the uh, COVID protections, you know, vaccinations and uh, personal protective equipment. And so the only, the only thing the insurance companies had to do was cover COVID vaccines, and that was good. But uh, that took the government. They didn't do it on their own.
Blonde Boy Wilson, why are we still talking about Democrats? We are green candidates. Question mark. We need to challenge Sanders and AOC with strong green candidates. Um, yeah, I have no problem with that. Um, I think we're going to do better in those races where you got moderate Democrats or Republicans um, because, you know, progressives are going to feel some loyalty to the Sanders and AOCs given they're on the extreme left wing of the Democrats. But uh, I have no opposition to challenging them on grounds that I've talked about. <clears throat> I mentioned Sanders, you know, basically accepting great power division of the world in the spheres of influence, which is not an anti-imperialist position. Uh, and AOC watered down the Green New Deal when she and Markey brought that non-binding resolution into the Congress, which dropped the ban on fracking the new fossil fuel infrastructure, dropped the phase out of nuclear power, dropped the deep cuts in military spending to help transfer resources, not just monetary resources, but technical human capital resources, engineers and so forth, to uh, the climate action, and then extended the deadline from 2030 to 2050 to get to zero emissions, except they called it net zero emissions, which is a backdoor way of allowing fossil fuel burning with so-called carbon capture and sequestration which hasn't proven itself to work uh, economically or even physically. I mean, they seem to be building these prototypes with public subsidies to get the public subsidies. And then in the end, some of them actually emit more carbon than they sequester. So um, yeah, there's plenty to criticize with these folks. Plus they are channeling people, and this is probably my biggest beef, they're channeling progressives into the Democrats where they can't get what they want because the shots in the Democratic Party are called by the corporate interests. And they actually benefit, the Democrats do, from progressives out there running as Democrats because they make the Democrats look better than they are. So I don't think we can avoid talking about Democrats, but you're right. We should be challenging everybody on a Democratic line, you know, whether they're the progressive side or the more conservative side, because... Uh, Inside the Democratic Party, they're 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 the tail on the uh, on the donkey, the Democratic donkey, and they make that donkey look better than it is. Mr. Anderson asks, "Will the bill stop Congress from purchasing stocks?" Pass. I haven't looked at it closely enough to, uh, you know, give you a prediction, uh, but it's popular among the people, and it seems to be one of those easy things Congress can do to make it look like they're fighting corruption, so it might pass. Uh, Pelosi kind of backed off. At first, she was dismissing the idea, but uh, it's, it's like an easy reform. It's like candidates, Democrats, these military people running here in my district are saying, I'm not taking corporate PAC money. That's not where the big bucks are anymore. You know, they're limited to $5,000 donations. Um, corporations, instead of putting it through their political action committee, can just bundle uh, contributions, which are up to $5,900 per person, I think, now, or $5,800 in this election cycle, and then bundle them in and then give it to the candidate, say, this is from Corporation X employees. And that can be unlimited. That could be a million dollars. So it's easy to say you're not taking corporate PAC money while you're taking bundles of corporate money. And that's, you know, the kind of games they play with us. So, yeah, being able to buy stocks on inside knowledge that you get as a member of Congress is obviously corrupt. And this law should pass. Uh, whether it will or not, I, I, I haven't done a, my own whip count, so I couldn't tell you at this point. Scout Trooper 164. And finally, what are your thoughts of Joe Biden continuing Trump's legacy of people having their retirement funds taken? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to there. Uh, their retirement funds taken. Um, you know, I just speak in, in my personal case. I mean, I had a Teamster pension, uh, like a lot of multi-employer pension funds, it was uh, 
going down the drain. Um, and so uh, they got a law passed, bipartisan. Uh, it was, I think, 2013. Uh, it was attached to the omnibus spending bill that had to pass Congress so the government could continue. And what it did is enable uh, multi-employer pension funds to cut our pensions that we'd earned, which the Employment and uh, Employment Retirement Income Security Act 1974 had said they couldn't do, but they made an amendment to that law. So my pension was cut 20%. And then what happened, it actually was Joe Manchin did this. Uh, he thought the uh, $400 uh, unemployment uh, supplement was too much. So he got it cut to 300 and with the money they saved, they put that into a bill that uh, gives money to these multi-employer pension funds, uh, enables them to borrow money. It was, I guess, collateral for loans. In any case, I'm getting my money back. I'm getting that 20% that uh, was cut. I'm going to start getting checks that uh, pay the full pension. And then the money I lost over a few years is going to be uh, paid back to me. And now my pension fund is working on that. They're taking their sweet time. But um, so in this case, I got my retirement fund restored. Um, so anyway, I should look in the comments. I haven't even looked over there. Um, see if you told me what pension fund you're referring to. Um, I'm not seeing anything. So I'm not sure what retirement funds you're talking about. Um, they did do a cost of living adjustment on Social Security, which is the biggest one in years. Um, so I'm not sure what you're referring to there. Violet at Content Boutique. Hi, what are your thoughts on the money Biden... Biden's leveraging over Afghanistan. Yeah, that money should be released. They're starving in Afghanistan. And it should go through humanitarian channels. They should negotiate that with the Taliban and get the people fed. Uh, the idea that, you know, we're mad at the Taliban for taking over, uh, so we're going to let people starve is just uh, obviously wrong and moral and not even smart politically. You know, you, you, the Taliban will explain to, you know, people in Afghanistan, the U.S. stole Afghanistan's money and is sitting on it. Now, what they decided this week is they're going to take some of the money and get it into humanitarian food relief. And they're going to take some of that money and give it to uh, victims of 9-11. Um, and I don't think, you know, victims of 9-11 should be taken care of, but I don't think you do with it with, the money of the Afghanistan people need to eat. Um, they weren't responsible for 9-11. That was Al-Qaeda. And while they were based in Afghanistan at the time, uh, it's not clear that the Taliban knew what uh, Al-Qaeda was about to do there. And, you know, there's a lot of reporting from that time that says Taliban was ready to turn over uh, bin Laden if uh, the U.S. provided evidence that he did it. And we just kind of dismiss that. So, um, yeah, the money should not be withheld. It's people are, you know, it's it, it's cold there. They don't have food. They're dying. You know, we should take care of people. Scout Trooper one sixty four. Howie, what do you think of the polls showing Americans want a peace deal with Russia over Ukraine? Yeah, the Americans want it. I think the Russian people want it. The Ukrainian people want it. Uh, they want peace. They don't want war. There was a statement out I saw this morning from the Congress of Intellectuals. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of weight they have within Russia, but they were telling Putin, you know, to you know pull back. Uh, there are statements I've seen from the Russian Socialist Movement, which is an independent left uh, movement. Uh, party in uh, Russia. There's a socialist movement called the Social Movement, uh, which is trying to get ballot status in in, the, in Ukraine. Um, they need 10,000 signatures. 
to get on the country's ballot, 44 million people. Here in New York, we need 45,000 signatures collected in 42 days to get on a ballot, a state with 19 million. Um, so, you know, U.S. talks about democracy but doesn't practice it. Um, so anyway, I you know, I've seen statements of uh, people on the left, the peace movement, uh, war resistors, or someone from Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I guess that's who sent out the Congress of Intellectuals in Russia's statement. Yeah, the people don't want war. It's just the warmongers, the military industrial types, and the business interests behind them. Those that sell arms, they make a lot of money, and those that want their assets protected. And, uh, you know, that's the roots of a lot of these wars. So, yeah, Americans want a peace deal, no doubt. In fact, I heard polling, can't remember the numbers, but yeah, very few Americans, I think it was 4% said we should get involved militarily in, in the Ukraine if, uh, you know, Russia does go in further. So um, I think I'm not surprised. Americans are tired of stupid foreign wars. Scout Trooper 164, how I asked this before and I'll ask again. What do you think of the corporations offering $15 an hour, but secretly ensure the promised amount isn't given via loopholes and saving it at the last second? Um, well, yeah. Um, or they offer 15 when the uh, labor is short, and then when the supply increases, they drop it back down. Uh, I know UPS, where I used to work, had a signing bonus. I think people were starting at 18 bucks an hour. Um, and, and they got a signing bonus. And, and now they're starting to drop back down. Because I think the contract, geez, what was the contract minimum? I think it was up to $12.50. I can't remember. Um, but anyway, uh, we need a federal statutory minimum. It should be 15 now, and it should start climbing to 20 over the next few years um, so that people who are working have a living wage and can pay the rent, put food on the table, and just, you know, live a decent life. Scout Trooper 164, Howie, what do you have to say that the Fed's claiming anyone asking their actions – Questioning their actions is terrorism. Asking since breaking points covered this. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the feds will question or they'll, they'll charge opponents uh, with terrorism, like sometimes environmental activists um, who do civil disobedience nonviolently or do property damage. Um, and they'll call that terrorism, which, you know, classic terrorism is harm of civilians for political ends and uh, terrorizing populations. So I think we got to be careful. There are laws like, you know, the take the right wing that, you know, did January 6th and tried to basically overthrow an election. There are some claiming we need uh, new anti-terrorism laws domestically in order to investigate these people. I'm really worried about that because we did the same thing with the Patriot Act and had a lot of uh, illegal spying and, you know, the NSA basically keeping metadata on everybody's phone calls, as Edward Snowden revealed. Um, you don't want to give the state that much power. Plus, there are laws, you know, when people engage in violent acts, there are laws against that. So um, I think that's something we got to be careful. I, I didn't see what breaking points did, so... Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but, you know, my general point is, uh, you know, be careful what power you give the state, uh, because even if it's originally aimed supposedly at the right, it will come back at the left, too.
and the Joe Rogan controversy. Uh, well, okay, the controversy is people are uh, leaving Spotify because they don't like what Joe Rogan said. And they're free to do that. That's their free speech. Joe Rogan said what he said. He used the N-word like 70 times, uh, totally disrespectful, uh, talked a lot of nonsense about COVID, brought on a bunch of quack doctors, um, and people left. So good for them. And uh, I don't know what else to say. You know, Joe Rogan, you know, he's paying the consequences for what he said. People don't agree with him. And they made themselves clear. Howie, uh, Violet at Content Critique. Howie, any comments on the Whippy controversy? I haven't followed it closely. I mean, she said uh, the Holocaust was a crime against humanity, not racism. And uh, I think, you know, she wasn't apologizing for the Holocaust. I think she was looking at it from an African-American point of view that, uh, you know, what has been done to black people on account of their race uh, is different, you know, to black people. You know, Jews look like white people like the Germans did. So, um, you know, it was an off-the-cuff remark, and it sure got a lot of attention, and she got suspended. I think that was probably overdoing it. Um, and she's, you know, I believe made amends and apologized. So um, I think... The thing is probably passed, and it, it was probably blown out of proportion. Um, and it, you know, it could have been a teaching moment. Instead, it became, you know, everybody takes sides and, you know, makes it worse than it is. Emily, what are your thoughts on Gavin Newsom keeping California in a state of emergency while hosting the Super Bowl party? Um, I'm not familiar exactly with that, although I know he's been caught going to parties without a mask when everybody else was supposed to be. Uh, it's like, you know, that, that Johnson prime minister in Britain, you know, these people get, you know, high and mighty and I uh, think they are the exceptions to the policies they put down, and that's wrong. Um, now, I'm not sure what to say. I, I just heard that Gavin Newsom was lifting the mask mandates, although Los Angeles County is keeping them for Super Bowl weekend and, and sometime into the future because their infection rates and hospitalization rates are high. So, look, I think Gavin Newsom is a – is a hypocrite. He, he's a slick liberal, but really, I mean, he comes from the real estate industry. When when he was running against Matt Gonzalez, the Green candidate for mayor of San Francisco back in two thousand three, and Matt got won the paper vote and or won the election day vote, and then when the paper ballots were counted, Newsom jumped ahead. I've always been suspicious of that because both the Democratic and Republican Party machines were backing Newsom against the green, Matt Gonzalez. And I always thought that, uh, I just had a suspicion those ballots were stuffed. But, you know, we'll never know for sure. But uh, I haven't liked the guy since then. He's, he's, uh, he's a corporate liberal, you know, socially liberal, but economically uh, with the corporate interests. We see that with all the fracking that's gone down in California under his watch. Uh, you know, he he kowtows to the agribusinesses and the oil and gas companies and, of course, the real estate industry in a state with huge homelessness problem and inequality that some people say is the worst of any state. Uh, we have data in New York that says we're probably the worst, but it's enormous in any case. And, you know, he doesn't really have a program to deal with that. Like, you know, he backed away. He, he campaigned on single payer, but he's backed away from it. So, yeah, he's just another hypocritical corporate liberal, socially liberal, economically conservative. And the liberal, social liberalism is often 
uh, opportunistic and not serious. Uh, kind of like Obama, who had to evolve on LBGTQ rights, you know, and, and uh, gay marriage. He didn't. He didn't take the position until it had majority in the in the public opinion polls. And uh, that's why we need the Greens. You know, Greens out here in New York and New Paltz started marrying people until a liberal Democratic attorney general named Elliot Spitzer uh, got an injunction against them. And the mainstream NGOs, you know, supporting gay rights were saying, oh, we're going to provoke a backlash. This is when uh, Karl Rove and the Bush Republicans were pushing anti-gay initiatives in a lot of states. But it put the issue on the table and people had to deal with it, including, ironically, Dick Cheney, who had a lesbian daughter who he defended. And, you know, I've never seen public opinion on a controversial social issue move so fast, but it did. And the Greens were the, one of the instigators of that. That's why we need to be out there. I know people are discouraged. We're not getting forward on climate change. Voting rights haven't passed. Um, we're now it's still in the back end, hopefully, of a pandemic, but all the economic protections have been removed. Evictions are ramping up. I mean, it's easy to get discouraged, but we have had victories. We have moved things forward. And, you know, people got to keep the faith. And I'll tell you one thing, you're going to feel a lot better if you're fighting than if you're sitting at home moping. So, you know, just, just uh, get out there and fight. Michael Shin. Newsom veto bills to let non-chartered cities have ranked choice voting and public banking. You're right. And I, you're just making my case against Newsom. Um, as I remember with ranked choice voting, you said people, basically he was saying people aren't smart enough to count the three and, and you know, rank their choices. And public banking was just uh, pandering to the private banking industry. I just stir, stir. Let's not forget that news, what Newsom did with PG&E too. Could have become a publicly controlled utility, but he bailed out his corporate donors. Yep, yep, you're making my point. You add it to the, to the evidence. And uh, yeah, that's one thing. We gotta have municipal utilities or publicly owned utilities if we're gonna move fast on this climate change because companies like PG&E are not gonna replace their uh, old servo mechanical grid. They can't accommodate distributed energy production from solar and wind uh, that are built around centralized power plants until they wear out. And so, and now you got the problem, and I think it may have been resolved in California where the uh, regulatory commission was gonna remove some of the, reduce the payments that people get for rooftop solar as net metering because uh, the utility said they couldn't accommodate it and it was costing them. But I think I heard that it got, that got defeated. So if it did, congratulations, California. If not, keep fighting. Well, no more questions are coming up, and it's been an hour, so it's time to wrap up. And uh, I think I gave a good wrap up earlier. You know, it, it's easy to get discouraged with what's going on. We're facing possibly a war in Ukraine. The climate crisis is not being solved. People are losing their voting rights. The Republicans are setting it up to steal elections by controlling election administration. The Democrats are feckless to fight that. We've talked about a whole lot of issues from, you know, public power, single payer health care, and it's easy to get discouraged. But like I said, you're going to feel a lot better and you're going to win some victories if you get out and fight. So, you know, let's go out there and, and uh, you know, keep fighting. Um, you know, the as they say, the objective conditions are on our side. You know, what we're talking about needs to be done. And on many of these issues, the people are already with us. We need to, just need to organize and mobilize them in elections and on the streets. And we can get a lot of this done. Um, so with that, I, I'll just remind you that next Saturday, I'll be talking with Matthew O., the Green Party candidate for U.S. Senator from North Carolina, 
who's an Iraq War veteran and Foreign Service officer who quit uh, the Foreign Service when he was in Afghanistan in protest of that war. And so he has a lot to offer. And so I hope you'll be here next week to listen to Matthew. So have a good week.